in the news and people complaining and saying, well, she can't say she's black because she's also Indian American. It's like, why can't she be both? And it all points to this issue of the problem society has with multiracial identity. It's not allowed to just stand on its own. So to understand why people are questioning Vice President Kamala Harris's blackness, I'm going to use that phrase, her blackness, we need to use history. And we need to go back to the one drop rule. The one drop rule has left a lasting impact on our society as Americans. So one significant finding from the 2015 study is that racial identity can be fluid over the course of one's life. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean you go to sleep black and you wake up white tomorrow? Hi, I'm Danielle Romero. Thank you so much for being with me here on my channel where we talk about American identity and family stories. And this may be the only non-political video you're going to see about Vice President Kamala Harris. I usually try to stay out of political stuff as far as... Uh, current day political stuff. I'm a trained historian. I love family history. I love studying American identity and family history. But what I saw being discussed this week about Vice President Kamala Harris is, is so incredibly connected to the historical discussion of race in America. And I'm not um, going to get on here and be talking about uh, what you think I'm probably going to be talking about. So I want you to stick with me. What does it mean to be black enough in America? What does it mean to be Italian enough in America? What does it mean to be Irish enough in America? White enough in America? Asian enough in America? Hispanic enough in America, in the United States of America? And because my husband and I, uh, we have been reading the news, we've been watching the news. Like I like to stay out of this stuff, but <laughs> things are unprecedented right now. And we're we're seeing a lot of people questioning Miss Kamala Harris being considered black, saying we, she isn't black, she shouldn't be getting called black. My husband wanted want to talk with me about this because he was shocked by that. He was shocked that that was a problem. He's like, okay, well, if you're going to go after somebody, he's like, that's, that's not the thing to go after. Why, why is that identity being questioned? Well, these, these questions tap into the deeper history of race and identity here in the United States. And some of this stuff I didn't know about, even as a historian, until I started researching my own family story from Louisiana. So today, I want to talk about Vice President Harris, but I want to talk about her in the context of history here, because that's, that's what I love. I love context is king, right? We need context. We need to understand how did we get to this point? And, and what do these words historically mean? I want to talk about the one drop rule and some of the new data on multiracial identity that came out from the Pew Research Center after the last census, the 2020 census, and, and, and talk about the broader implications for uh, how we see each other and how we see ourselves here. Kamala Harris made history as the first African-American and South Asian-American woman elected vice president of the United States. Her victory was a big deal for a lot of communities, whether or not, you know, you're on the right, the left, or nowhere <laughs> like I am. But despite this amazing achievement, some people still have questioned her black identity, black with a capital B. Okay. And I think the skepticism says more about America's complicated views on race than it does about this Kamala Harris's self-identification. So her background is a classic example of what people like to call the American melting pot. Now, born to an Indian mother, not Native American, from India, and a Jamaican father, she grew up with a rich blend of cultural traditions. In her autobiography, The Truths We Hold, she talked about how her mom made sure that she appreciated and understood and was connected to her Indian culture while knowing that society would see Kamala and her sister as black women. The dual identity, I think, is... It's unique and it's not unique here in the United States. Now, her mixed race identity, I think, is on one hand amazing. It's the powerful testament to the diversity of the American experience. It highlights the fact that our, our ethnic identity, racial identity, isn't totally fixed, but can be fluid. And that what I mean by that is not that it's changing day by day, but it could be shaped not only by our personal experiences, by society, but also societal perceptions. I have experienced that myself as I have done this journey in public researching my family's story. My great-grandmother who 
left her ancestry behind in Louisiana. At least she tried to when she moved to New York during the 1930s. And the difference between how I saw myself, how I was raised, what I was told about myself and my family, what we were told versus how we were perceived. And so for Harris, being both black and South Asian, I think it reminds us that identity is not about fitting into a single box. But here in the United States, we want people in that box. We cannot deal when people don't fit in that box, right? We can't deal with it and we bully people and we harass people and we do everything we can to make sure that they know that they can't be just going over two boxes, like not allowed, right? So Kamala's mother, I think it's pronounced Shyamala, was born in 1938 in India. She earned a PhD uh, in a master's program at UC Berkeley, and she made significant strides in breast cancer research. And her father is named Donald Jasper Harris, and he was born in Jamaica, and he studied at the University of London before he got his PhD in economics at the University of uh, UC Berkeley. And he met Kamala's mother there at a meeting of the Afro-American Association. They got married in 1963, and even though Kamala's parents divorced when she was young, they both played a huge role in shaping her identity. She spent time with her grandparents in India and relatives in Jamaica as a child. So to understand why people are questioning Vice President Kamala Harris's blackness, we to use that phrase, her blackness, we need to use history. And we need to go back to the one drop rule. This rule was actually codified in many, many states in general, but my focus has often been on Louisiana because that's where my family's story, so much of my family's story comes from. And in Louisiana, I believe the one drop rule wasn't overturned until 1982 or 1984, uh, which was basically if you had one ancestor that was not, not was black or was colored or mulatto, uh, so were you. And it was used to enforce racial hierarchies and deny rights to mixed race people. There was no mixed race people under this law, right? It truly is the most binary. You're white or you're black. And even though that was rooted in old Jim Crow racism, it's an idea that still affects how Americans see race today. The one drop rule originated in the midst of slavery, and it was perpetuated through the Jim Crow era. And it maintained those strict racial divisions, right, of who who is allowed to drink out of this water fountain? Who is allowed to go to the school? Who is allowed to look up on the sidewalk while they were walking and not shuffle down to the side and worse, right? But despite the historic origins, the one drop rule has left a lasting impact on our society as Americans. It's influenced how we perceive race and has forced individuals into rigid categories. For multiracial people, like Ms. Kamala Harris, this rule complicates their identity and society is trying to fit her and any other any other person into these predefined racial boxes you know you have you have people who don't fit into these boxes but now the boxes are here and they're like you've got to pick one ronald r sundstrom the author of the browning of america wrote an article for vox and that's what he said quote ultimately it's a mixed person's prerogative to be fluid in their identity and for them to sometimes hold one or both and for that to change over time and harris's life and career embody this fluidity and shows that your racial identity can evolve and adapt to different contexts. It doesn't mean that you're changing it from day to day, but I want to talk a little bit about what the Pew Research Center analysis said about the 2018 and 2020 U.S. Census data. And before we get into that, I want to just kind of bring in my own experience here because as much as I, I, don't, I think anyone can talk about history, anyone should talk about history. You don't need to be a certain color or, or background to talk about any history. That's my firm belief. All knowledge is for all people. But we bring a bias into whatever we study. And I'm bringing my own personal biases into this conversation of, of understanding the power that the one drop rule still holds. Many people don't even realize what that rule is today. They may not know the phrase, they may not know the history behind it, but there is a subconscious look of, if, if you were one drop African, like you're not white, you couldn't be white, how could you be white, right? And it all points to this issue of the problem society has with 
multiracial identity. It's not allowed to just stand on its own. And Harris, who is so the daughter of immigrants from Jamaica and India, like we said, is part of a growing group of Americans with multiracial background. According to the Pew Research Center analysis of the 2018 U.S. Census Bureau data, so our census records here in the United States uh, from 2018, about 6 million U.S. adults reported being two or more races here in the United States. Approximately 31% selected another combination, which sometimes was three or more races. Now, the 2000 census, though, was a landmark moment here in the United States, which recognized the multiracial population for the first time. Because for the first time, American citizens were able to choose more than one race to describe themselves. So this led to more accurate estimate of our nation's diversity. So one significant finding from the 2015 study is that racial identity can be fluid over the course of one's life. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean you go to sleep black and you wake up white tomorrow? No, no. But almost 70% of Americans who reported being more than one race, they said they always had seen themselves as multiracial. So out of all the people who are multiracial, self-identifying, about 70% said they always knew it. They've always seen themselves that way. But that means that there was about 30% of people who said there was a time that they identified as only one race. So something's happening there where maybe they grew up a certain way without information or you know they've wrestled with something or decided something has changed for them that they've decided to embrace all of their ancestry. And the study also found that one in five adults with a multiracial background, so about 21%, felt pressure from friends, family, and society to choose one race over another. 21%. This pressure was particularly pronounced among multiracial adults with a black background, who were often encouraged to identify as solely black. I think Vice President Kamala Harris's journey illustrates this challenge as she's navigating expectations placed on her to embody all the aspects of her heritage perfectly, which is impossible is impossible. But many adults with multiracial backgrounds don't consider themselves multiracial. I think I would probably have fallen into this category up until recently, and I'm still working through that. Honestly, I don't know. But this says in 2015, 61% of those people who had mixed race heritage based on their ancestors didn't identify as multiracial. And the reasons for that varied. They said sometimes it was their family upbringing. They weren't raised multiracial, so they didn't see themselves multiracial the way they looked. They didn't feel like they looked the right way to identify as both or, or close identification with one race. They grew up with this identity and that's just where they feel the most comfortable. I think what Vice President Kamala Harris's story is shining a light on the complexities of multiracial identity in America because for the longest time it has not been allowed and there are still some voices out there saying it is not allowed. Uh, again, I'm not getting political here, at least in the sense of getting involved in this presidential race. But I want you to think about the headlines that you're seeing in the news and people complaining and saying, well, she can't say she's black because she's also Indian American. It's like, why can't she be both? Why can't she be both? Right. Uh, I, I've, I've actually seen that. And my husband and I were talking about that one in particular, where people are saying, well, she used to be called Indian American and now she's she's black to leverage black voters, whatever. It's like, no, she's she's both. I, I have talked to people and been interviewed because of my Italian heritage and the work I've done on my Italian side by Italian communities. I've also done work and talked to people about my Creole heritage. I had work included in a peer reviewed journal for a historically black college, Xavier University out of New Orleans. They have a, a great Creole journal there. And and I was able to contribute to that last year. And I was so proud of that. And I was allowed to do that, even though I'm also Italian. You know, what I'm saying like it's it's not either or it's it's both and it's both and. And I, I think, again, it's one of those incredible things for me as a historian to look at and say everything that happens is connected to the past every single thing nothing is standing on its own there's nothing new under the sun and it is essential to recognize as the nation continues to grow and evolve and change to reconsider our definitions of race and i saw a quote that i just wanted to share 
se como Kamala Harris see herself. And she said during a 2019 campaign event, how do I describe myself? I describe myself as a proud American. And I think that at the end of the day, it's beautiful to embrace all the parts of your, your heritage and your ancestry. You should, it's yours to own, it's yours to claim. But at the end of the day, what will unite us is, is standing together and saying, I'm a proud American. We are all proud Americans, despite our racial background, despite our ethnic background. That's, that's where the unifying needs to come in. So let me know what you think. If you have seen some of these headlines questioning her black identity, and what your thoughts are. Otherwise, we'll talk soon.